Hello, good evening, greetings to all that are here with us in the 24th International Edition of Education of the Legion of Goodwill. We are united to speak about this important theme for all of us and about a view that's more impacting in the conditions that we are going through in the pandemic so many perceptions that we have to share with you, learnings, experiences, and we have a lot of happiness to have you, educator, professional of education, interested, and all uh, together with us and beginning now. Together we are live today and tomorrow accompanying content, sharing experiences, and you who are accompanying us you can also be also and do your inscrip- your registration, especially those that are not participating in this event. So they will be with us together accessing www.lbv and you will be with us. Now to begin our conversation, we invite all for our greetings of peace that we accompany our the beginning of the decade of 1940, in the moment of respect of all, in this tradition, a pace of fraternity, in the respect of religions, people that have different perceptions of religion, but we unite for love that is in our heart, God present. Jesus lives in our hearts forever. So once again, we start this encounter and we have some messages for you. We are live through YouTube and our chat will be on, available for you to register with us. Put your name, your city, so you connect with us. And if you have a question, you can also ask because our Staff is prepared and will answer your doubts. We are in YouTube. Another invitation is for you that is accompanying posts in the social networks, and we will be there, and it's Aroba LBV Brazil. Like this, we will post you during our transmission today and tomorrow with these invitations. Now we will begin our program of today, especially in the theme that we will approach. We are going through the challenges of recuperating uh, lost pedagogical contexts after two years of COVID and also many things that occurred. And so we also have an all perceived you that is accompanying us, the impacts, the emotional impacts of the emotional and mental health of educators, children, families, and how this has appeared in the classroom, in the environments of the school. And so now we are gonna speak about in this edition the experiences of the institution potentialize the capabilities of the students so they can deal with challenges from planning and also uh, and also welcoming emotionally students teachers and also families this is a subject that's very important with impacts that will be gone through during a long time. And it's so important, the ability and spirituality that makes the difference in the goodwill, in the Legion of Goodwill. Now we will start our program like we always did in the Legion of Goodwill, thinking and and we cannot conduct our students and conduct our children and I speak as a mother, if we're not also prepared for this. So if we want to think of the emotional health of an environment in school, we have to take care of our emotional health. So now we will have a minute of silence, and so our thinking will be more tranquil, our emotions more peaceful, and we will have the music, prayer of tranquility, lyrics and music of Paiva Neto, and it's special for the pains of all those that suffer. Now, one instance of silence.
In this moment of silence and spirituality, and we tranquilize our heart, it is a tradition of the Legion of Goodwill to look at all people, looking at everything besides intellectual, the, the professionals that couldn't have their needs forgotten. That's why during this encounter, we will also speak about the professionals of the teachers and all those that help to continue to take care of our children in the learning that was so impacted by the conditions of the COVID. And now we are going to continue our program to bring you the words of Nicolas de Paiva, and he will represent José de Paiva Neto. Good evening, all that accompany the 24th Congress, International Congress of Education of the Legion of Goodwill in Internet, a lot, many parts of Brazil and all over the world. It's an honor to represent the president of LGW, José de Paiva Neto, who's my grandfather also, challenges and mental health and reflexes of the pandemic, a view besides the intellectual. My greetings to all dedicated that are professionals that are involved in this transmission and are also solidarity to the families that face big challenges because of the pandemic of COVID-19 that also needs care. We have to continue to do our part. In his article, The Global Solidarity Agenda, New Times, Globally Solidarity, the, the, the educator, Pai Vanath, would defend education with quality, but the difference of economical spirituality that brings and calls our attention to the need to engage hearts, to illuminate minds in times that are very challenging for humanity. This moment, we, from so many missionaries, the humanity has to understand that nothing will help to illustrate the mind if the heart was forgotten. And this is a complete delirium to desire the progress of society if the principles of trust and respect are rare in the relations that are interpersonal. It is necessary to engage with the good will universal in our hearts. And these are the words of Paiva Neto. And this is the encounter of the need of emotional health focus of this encounter, that we can engage our hearts with the inspiration of the new commandment of Jesus, Jesus, that we love each other like I loved you. So like this, there's an education that illuminates, that transforms, that changes destinies, that protects and, and what we want for our children and youngsters. So don't lose, he don't lose hope for better days. Seek new opportunities and learnings. Thank you very much. And a great Congress encounter. We thank Nicolas de Paiva representing the Legion of Goodwill. An excellent event for all of us today and tomorrow. United in this conversation, and this is how we want it. So that's why you send your participation through our chat in the YouTube. And it's a tra tra tradition in the Legion of Goodwill. We will have music, which is SOS Earth, lyrics, and the Infant Juvenile Choral. Chorus.
SOS Earth Music and Lyrics, Legion of Goodwill from São Paulo. We sang about hope. This is the message that this song brings, the renovation of our hope in a better world for the children that are taught to take care of Mother Earth. This was a special production for this event. You saw at the end all the names of those that were involved, and we want to thank you all. In the preparation for the chorus, Alziro Tonido, Deli Francisco, and Nilton Duarte. The preparation of the dance group, Ana Carolina Santos Oliveiro. And the preparation of the instruments, Denise Oliveira, Juliana Cassia, Leopoldo Cassia, and the preparation of the Philharmonic Goodwill. The production by Elizabeth Dandradi e Alinini Passos. And the staff of the Legion of Goodwill, João Vitor Duarte e Eduardo Isaízes. And we also have a special highlight about the production. An ex-student of our school played a special instrument, Marco Antonio Botelho. You will see his picture of Marco. He's playing this instrument. That's a special instrument. And he also participated in this encounter. You who are accompanying us, and also you will see, it's to participate in our chat in the YouTube, sending the name of your city, and we will thank you. And also other countries. It's an international con congress. So there are countries from Europe, United States, South America, all united for a challenge all over the world. Different languages, different realities, they can be diverse. But the challenges of learning and emotional health are the reflexes of the pandemic all over the world. Now we will see a view besides the intellectual. This is also part of the Legion of Goodwill. We want to take advantage of the training. And now we will start with the first lecture today of Talita Pazetu. She's the speaker that will speak about an important theme, which is practical strategies to stimulate learning. Talita Pazetu is a pedagogue. She's also postgraduate in psychopedagogy, and she also does uh, work in the area of evaluation in difficulties, in difficult disorders and also in development. She's the director of Premio Nutismo, which is a center that attends children as a teacher in courses of post-grad in psychopedagogy. And also, she also teaches in psychopedagogy and many other subjects. She's also a speaker in various themes in education, and she has research in the focus of child development, like preschool issues, writing, reading. She's the mother of two children, and she will speak about us, and she'll speak to us about this, accompanying the practical strategies to stimulate Learning. Hello, everyone. I am Talita Pazetu, and it's wonderful to be here with you again, and this time on the screen. But who knows, soon we will be in the wonderful theater of the Legion of the Goodwill, and I was here a few years ago, and it was great. Now we are going to speak a little about about practical strategies to stimulate learning. All my research was the focus to identify which are the abilities in child education that influence the development of reading, writing, and math in the first grade. In the first grades also, I am a university teacher 
in grad and post grad, 10 years, and also with degrees in psychology and other, and in the post grad in psychopedagogy. And I also, for 10 years, I was. Uh, psychopedagogical, and I, lect and I also had a lot of lectures. Presently, I work with autistic children. I'm always, what's always so important, I'm a, I have mother of these two kids, and Meli is still, I was still pregnant, and now, and who knew me, this is a little bit about my story and my path. And today, I prepared to speak about practical stat strategies to stimulate learning. Why this theme? We come from a situation that's very um, sensitive because of the pandemic, and everyone was surprised with what happened. Schools, children, teachers, parents. No one was prepared to be so much time away from the school environment and or had to think of strategies that could be used in this situation. And so it was something that everyone became surprised. No one was really prepared. And so after a lot of adaptation, a lot of studies, how to do videos and online classes, Kids are back, thanks. But Brazil was one of the first countries that the kids left the skill schools and the last ones to come back. So the kids remain two years, almost a year and a half, two years away from school. And this is what we're going to talk about, how we can stimulate the learning after all this situation. After everything happened, how are students, how they are, and also this is what we're going to talk about. When we think of all these areas that were affected by social isolation, the biggest, the most harm of all was the child, the damaged. Because, ah, oh, you'll say, but why do you say the students were the most damaged? I also was harmed. For me, it also was difficult, but we cannot forget that the children are in a moment of developing various items. Us adults already developed abilities that are necessary to deal with this kind of situation, to have a better understanding, to be able to have the dimension of our feelings. And the child, no, he, the child is developing this. And from one day to the next, he was taken away from the main area where he lives where he lives and he's with the children. It's where he establishes uh, with his relations with others and where he also uh, is fed with so much um, content. School is where the child can protect also the child. And so all the children were not able to be in this area. And so it affects how they see learning or, it's, or the situation of learning. So they were taken away, they were online, they could not be with their other friends. They had to then learn a new system, which is the online system, which was very new to them. It was very difficult. Now they are coming back to school. And how, as a teacher, how do I do this? How do I deal with this? One of the abilities that most affected is executive functions. And these executive functions, it was like a control of our, it's like the maestro. It's here and it's cortex, prefrontal cortex, and this helps for us to establish goals and achieve them. We can pay attention what is necessary. Can you imagine a system of control of airplanes? The guy is says, go down one plane, come up one plane. There's a lot of information all at the same time. Our brain does the same thing. While you are watching the lecture, your cell could send you a message. You could be worried what you're going to have for lunch. You could be worried with the work that you have to deliver later. Various informations that your brain is receiving. And so you have to know what is prioritized. 
And so now I hope it's my lecture that you're hearing me, but even wanting to prioritize, it is difficult to ignore the other stimulations. And who does this is our functions, executive functions in the brain. They will help us do the planning and control the the behaviors that are not adequate. They will permit that how we plan. And if something is wrong, we will think, oh, what other situation, alternative, this environment will give me so I can resolve this situation? And then you'll think, I need a bathroom. So you control or you find a bathroom. But there, then the bathroom is yellow. You can't go in. But you want to go to the bathroom. So you have to think of alternatives. Maybe there's another bathroom. You're not there Stop, without movement, you think of alternatives. And so you think they are simple things and basic, but they are functions that our brain controls so we can achieve these goals. So when we think of these functions, and I put here on on the screen um, this, this um, graphic, you will see when it comes up that it shows the development of the executive functions. So sometimes you can see the development is very big of from zero to five years. So you call this first childhood. Then you after you'll have another growth when you're adolescent. And then when they are almost 25 years, what happens? They stabilize, and so you see there's a fall after 30, because you're more than 30, I'm sorry, but your curve is already going down, but a little. It's not, you know, a lot, but it's a small decline. But this has, it has a 10 until it declines till an old, old age. And so for us, when we think of school environments, this means that we are dealing with people that are being developed. This is very important because us as professionals of education, we have the power, look what a strong word, to potentialize the learning or even not to make it happen. We have that ability. So now we will see some strategies that you can use to help this learning. And so this theme, what happened during the pandemic, I'm gonna show you how we matured through the brain. Look at the first brains. It's the same brain, but there are different points of view. One is a lateral one, and the other is a top view. As you can see, the brain starts with various areas, green, yellow, and, and blue, and with the years, it becomes more blue. And this gray mass, this brain is becoming more mature. So when we see a child and we think, why can't the child do this? It's so simple because the child still doesn't have the necessary maturity. This maturity, this image that is the image of 2006, it happens after 20 years. So it's around 20. We can consider that the brain is mature. There's recent studies that say this is during the 25, 28 years. So people are taking a longer time to mature. And so we have this situation of pandemic with these children out of school. If it wasn't easy for us that we have this kind of brain, can you imagine for our kids and our adolescents that didn't have all this abilities that were developed? It's more difficult. So when we think of a child, many teachers say, no, I cannot understand what my children want. I propose things, but they don't do it. I know all this was difficult that everyone went through, all the kids went through. But in one moment, did someone stop to, and looked at the kids and started to speak with them? You have to listen to the children. Everything that happened, everyone was, worried about the students because they can't lose content, they cannot lose classes. But this is a question that I ask. How many of you arrived 
to your students and ask them how they were feeling with everything they went through or how they are feeling coming back to class or ask a student, what do you like to do? What would you like to do? What activity or proposal you would like to do? Sometimes the teacher is worried about all this because it's difficult to engage children in the learning, how I stimulate learning. And the first thing is to understand who are your students, understanding their development, how they are, how old they are, what is expected that they should know or not known in this phase. But for this, you have to listen to them. And you have to ask them, how do you guys feel, kids? What do you want? And what task would you like to do? And with this, our focus cannot only be in the content. I know this is leaving many teachers crazy because what you know, also the parents, but as a school and as teachers, we should know how to give a counseling to the parents. They will ask questions, they will have demands, and they don't know exactly why. They're ang you know, there's anguish, and so it's us educators, educators to give them this answer. So when we think of content, there's this situation, I need to give them the content of the last two years. No, you do not have to. If this is your thought, I tell you, many students will not do well. It'll be a failure because we will have a generation of students with learning difficulties. If we consider if I have to take care of all the content of two years that were lost. But Talita, but weren't they two years away from school? So you have to tell me that I can't do all this? I'm just telling you, this should not be your preoccupation. Why? Because if we think I am a teacher of the third grade in 2022, my kids, my students, the second and first grade were out of the school. Now I have to work the content of the third grade. You know what's going to happen? Many kids with difficulties. Why? Because one of our, one of our goals in this coming back, and this is what I'm going to tell you in the slides, no one can be left back. This is not the content. That's the difference. It's not the content is that I lost. I'm speaking about the student, the child. No student can be left at the back. What does this mean? That if you are going to focus on the content, if you're going to be worried with the content that was lost, you don't look at the student. And then you believe that has to be dealt with the student doesn't correspond, doesn't answer, and then the student becomes frustrated, you become frustrated. Why? Why do we have to stop and think now? What are the processes of learning? What are the abilities that these kids should have developed? Did they develop this? So let's think in abilities and content. So I am a third grade teacher. I'm going to work multiplications, multiplying. But this student to arrive at multiplying, they had to work with summing up. They had to do numerical successions. They had a lot of content that came before multiplying. So I could be a third grade teacher, but now we have to teach multiplying. But I cannot speak about what should be done in the first, second grade. I don't have this time. But if I don't look at the student that's in front of me, investigate what he knows and doesn't know, and I will think that I have to teach them to multiply from this point on, I will have a lot of students with difficulties because for me to deal with that content, that concept, I have, con I have abilities that are previous that have to be resumed. So what I want to tell you, be careful with this perception. perception. I have to run 
to be careful with the content that was lost. It's not the content that's the most important. It is the students. They are the most important. And I brought to you a slide that is the one that I presented to you two years ago. Who saw my lecture two years ago and still is not implementing it now is a reminder. I am looking at the child. I am worried with the content that was, with the abilities that were passed. And what do you want me to do to go and continue? I have to first make a path for these my kids. I have to know them. And many of the teachers will say, I cannot lose time doing this. But to evaluate your student is not to lose time, is to identify what has to be dealt with with this student. You have to know what is the difficulty of my student? What is the potentiality of the student? What is this is what he knows and what does he like? What does he do not, what he doesn't know? And then your content enters. What do I want him to learn? What is the content that I have to deal with, work with? This student has the pre-requirements to do and deal with this content. If he doesn't have these pre-requirements, it doesn't help to work with or teach multiply. I have to stop and resume. <laughs> There's a lot of preoccupation of make sure that the content is being taken care of. But you have to look at the students, because if you don't do this, you will be bringing more content and more content, and the children will not be able to develop. They won't be learning. So it's very important that you, yes, evaluate and to see the contents that you want to develop. So I want that everyone wants to work with this, this ability that is three. Do they have ability two? Do they have ability one? And if they don't, I cannot deal with three. I can't teach three. So teacher and student are frustrated. So for me to identify what my kids know, I have to evaluate the kids. And the evaluation is a strategy. Here I put evaluation here. It is so important. And many people don't see this as something with learning. But evaluation is the best moment that you have to know what your students developed or not developed. So you make evaluation. I have a class with 30, and I give the grades, C, B, A. What does this mean? What does this mean? When I evaluate, when I make evaluation, I have to do analysis. This is very important. Let's say I have 30 students, and these 30 students, 25 didn't did make made a mistake on question one. So I didn't write the question one very clearly, or they were confused, or the content in the question one, my kids didn't understand it. They didn't know it. And so they had grade 10, 9, 8, A, B, C, but this grade gives us data so we can analyze. So the evaluation is so essential when we think of the learning process. But coming back to the themes of strategies to stimulate students, and a strategy that I put here for you that is very interesting is that you have in mind we deal with different students, different people. So if you have 30 students, you have 30 little minds that learn differently in different ways. So we have different strategies for stimulate this learning. For instance, that we are talking now, this lecture, I am talking, you are seeing me and you are hearing me. You know what kind of stimulation this is? Traditional. 
but talit a traditional but why because traditional is those strategies that have the privilege especially the view the vision and the hearing so we have someone speaking that could be you teacher we now it's me and we will have the students listening hearing so the stimulation is not bad the traditional stimulation is not bad. It has the context and the way of occurring. In a lecture, which we are having, this is the best stimulation that we have. Is the best stimulation for the children? No. Can you imagine if all your classes with your kids, first, second grade, if you're talking and the kids are learning, what are the chances of this to go well, that this traditional stimulation go well? So, so when we balance this, we have to say the multi-sense, multi-sensorial, multi-sensorial. I am with the multi senses, multiple essential stimulus with view, contact, hearing tasting with the awareness of the body and so it is simple you could come show the letters the, so you will say this is a kids this is letter a and then you can say words that start with various letters and they will say a audition a will go to the, we will go outside and we will see everything that has the letter A. And every time they see something with the letter A, they will cl clap their hands. And so we are going to different situation. So we go in the class and we show the letter A. And the other situation is when we go outside and we show various stimulations and they will see what are the items with letter A. And this is what we call multisensorial. The multisensorial is more it, it's it, it's it's more challenging for the child. It's more interesting because they are various interesting because we have letter A, but with various entrances. So the chance of the student to learn and to attain more students is bigger because if each one of you have different stimuluses, and so many that are listening to me are writing and taking notes of everything that I am speaking about. And I am writing, writing everything that I'm saying. Others are just listening and paying attention. Fine, that works for that person because there's not a pattern, a standard. Each person learns differently. And us as educators, the main strategy to stimulate learning is to vary the entrance of this learning. So just leaving the situation of teachers talking and the student listening and go to other situations. And this has to do with various grades. So if you are, for instance, teachers of mid-school, try for your kids to, a different way of to see that way of learning instead of writing question answer question answer ask them to make a drawing or to make something else a little video a small video or maybe a maquette because we are so used to always writing or listening and looking and answer that the students don't expect that we try to stimulate the learning in other ways. We have the possibilities and some are, you have to, uh, are harder to do, more labor, but sometimes they're more efficient. So I would like to teach my kids like I am, now, my kids are listening to me all the time, sitting, and them listening. Do you think this will be efficient? No, this isn't interesting for the kids or, you know, the best. And another form to a stimulate is involving the families. Why families? Because in the pandemic, the responsible 
of those that had to learn were the parents at that time. You know, the families before, it was like an option. You know, I will or will not participate. But with the pandemic, they didn't have this option because the kids were with them. So they had to prepare the space. They had to have available the technical, technological, technological medias for the children to see this in the Internet. The parents had to this time stimulate the kids. And so it's to bring to the families some doubts that they have. So, for instance, the family doesn't know what my child needs to learn in content this semester. What are the abilities or capabilities that he has to develop? But these are practical issues. So why are you speaking of the parents? Sometimes say, ah, but you're dealing with this and that in school. And they try to teach the students. Or sometimes the student is letter A, and the father thinks he should be at Z. And so then at home, the parent is starting to work with things that wasn't worked with in the class. So it's important to have a connection, parent, teacher, student. So it's important to have this connection. What, so it's no, what, so it's important that the teacher be integrated with the school. This is very important. And the pe teachers should also help the parents because these are their doubts that the parents have and that the teachers did not explain this how the parents should deal with these situations. And so in the beginning, it's always in the beginning of the semester, speak with the families how they could and should get involved, what is expected from them. This calms the family in terms of anxieties of what the child has to develop. And you can also be more aligned with the families. This is one of the strategies. Another strategy is to know your student, but really know him, get to know him. How's his family, what he likes, what he doesn't like, what may, what's easy for him, what's his difficulties, what's his history, where does he come from, where, how much time he has been in this school. You make a little, a little, get like this, you get to know your student. You make a form. You say, but I don't have time. But the more time you have knowing your student, it'll make it easier for you because you'll know what your group needs. Who is your group? What are the difficulties? And what are their facilities? What, what's easy for them? Another strategy, prefer questions. Don't give ready answer. As a teacher and mother, this is my biggest difficulty. Why? Because it's easier to speak what the other has to do than to give this time for the other thinks what he has to do. And this is a slide. These are two very clear examples. You say like this to the kids. They cannot when the colleague is telling a story. So you have this agreement. Pedro, shh, be quiet. I just told you. It's to be quiet when João is reading the story. It's his turn to speak. Be quiet. We, do, we already tell the kid to be quiet all the time. What would be the desirable? Before I, this, I will tell him, Pedro, what should you be doing now? What is your role in this moment? So I have to give you a space and the, he give space to the student so he knows what he should do at that moment. So when I had the phase of teaching my child to put on and take off his clothes, and so it's easy for me to do it for him. But when my child was four, he did it alone and it took a long time that he has to keep repeat that process till he learns. Learning is repetition. And I, as a mediator, mediator in this situation, I have to give the path. Push it this way, pull it up this way. Remember how I taught you? 
the shorts are they on the right side the bermudas which is the right side i have to give space for the my child and in school it's the same thing many times the teachers don't give space for the children I tell them what to do, and the teacher tells them what to do. So do you give opportunity so that these students can think of what they have to do? Or you just tell them, give instructions all the time, and if they ask a question, you keep telling them what they have to do. Another example, for instance, student doesn't do something that the teacher wants them to do. You tell them to do one way, they do another way. What do we do normally? Pedro, look, I told you, you don't do it this way. First, you open the book on page so-and-so. Take the blue uh, cray and paint the fish. We give them instructions. What is the desirable is to ask, Pedro, what has to be done? And like we arranged, so you think what you are doing is the right way or is it the wrong way? We give a moment for the child to think because what do they perceive? These are the strategies that are bringing is material, is EFX. It's a program, a prevention in the school environment. Normally, we speak to the child to do something or not do something. And there's no effort to pay attention because he knows you will repeat this. If he, he says, uh, what is it to do? And you'll, he'll ask again, what do I have to do? They know that you're going to repeat this various times. But if you do this two, three times, but what can you imagine a week? You have to do all the opportunities all the time till there's a moment that your student understands the teacher is not going to repeat what I have to do. The teacher is going to make me think of what I have to do. But this doesn't happen from one day to the other. This has to be trained. We have a negative view about this word trained to memorize. So we associate to traditional learning. No, learning needs training repetition this is what makes that we are able to put information in a long-term memory the more i repeat it enter into contact contact no it is not negative it depends how you stimulate S traditional stimulation or multisensorial stimulation another example what I can do f to help my student, give them autonomy. So we tell the kids, you have half an hour to do this task. What is half an hour? Half an hour is very abstract for a child. They don't know what half an hour is. How do I teach a child what is half an hour? And this is a strategy of of organizing time. I go to the board and I write like, an image, here I show a circle, and as time goes by, I will fill in this circle. When I do this the first time, it's like nothing, because the children will not understand. But in every time that I deal with time, and I show them that I will not tell them the time is up, I will paint, and they have to look. So this, there are two parts that are painted. And so the first days that you implement this, you will tell them what you are doing. You see, I almost painted the whole circle. This is half an hour. Another difficulty that the teachers have is controlling the students and so, come on, time is up. Come on, kids, the time is up. Or there's 20 more minutes and they did it in five. So with this, we will teach our students to have autonomy in. I see the task, I analyze time. I see how much time I have to do this task, how much time I have for this task. And then they will learn to organize their time. You can also do also with routine. So every day you will put what are the tasks that you will do that day. So normally what we do, 
we, you know, one, two, three, four, and then we sort of show them when it's over. So when I gave an example, we go to the bathroom, the bathroom is closed. We have to show the students that things that we plan do not come out like we wish. For instance, we had a little, we were going to go to the outside and play, but we didn't go out and play because it was raining. But if it's simple, but if I don't, but it seems easy, but the students have to think about this because sometimes it's lack of control. It's raining and there's nothing I can do. The students were expecting this, so I have to work with the students. So we think of alternatives because we expected to do this and it was not possible. So we have to share this with the kids. The other issue is external mediators. And it's what the children should learn what they have to do. And what is happening is that students many times don't hear when it's their time. Now it's Pedro has to speak. Other children speak together. So now we do use an outside media. So here, for instance, is a paintbrush. The tip, I'm going to put a mouth. And the, here I'm going to put an ear. Now it's my turn to talk and the students have to listen. Me, Talita, I take my little paintbrush with the mouth and each student takes the ear. So they have a little kit, mouth and ear. And what happens if the student forgets what he has to do? He's holding something like an ear in his hand that's going to remind him that he has to listen and not speak. Talita, so when am I going to use this? Every time when students are speaking and listening, and like this, when they will understand the contents, the context, so they have to know when they have to listen and when they talk. They have to listen when they talk. The children are in development. And so this is not to irritate you, but sometimes they forgot that they are not at the moment that they have to talk, they have to listen. So we use this exterior stimulus. Like this, the children will learn how to control themselves. What other strategies you can use? Any age, drawings, sometimes you could do um, maquettes, sometimes you could do maps, sometimes reviews. Sometimes videos, pictures, sometimes you could use and engage our students because we want that we want them to do things the same way. I want them to engage, but as a teacher, I am only stimulating them the traditional way. But to stimulate the children various ways, me as a teacher, I have to remember that they are in development, they went through a difficult moment with the COVID, but there has to be a repertoire that they are coming back, we have to hear them, listen to them, speak with the families, and use various strategies to work with these contents, various contents. This is my email, and who has doubt, please, here I am. And I also use Instagram, Facebook, here are all my addresses. And here, get in contact or speak with the Legion of Goodwill. Thanks very much for this invitation. We thank you, Talita, so much. Talita Pazeto, pedagogical postgraduate in psychopedagogy, master and doctor in disorders in development. She spoke about practical strategies to stimulate learning. This is the big differential to bring this into the schoolroom for families inside. And also this was one of the reflexes of the pandemic, the family, the environment of the home also transformed itself and 
and it transformed itself into the classroom. And we will have the opportunity to speak about this today and tomorrow, about these pedagogical practices that contemplated these challenges and found solutions and like this face this challenge. Now we are going to think and speak about this and thank you all that are here with us and are in the chat in the YouTube and we reserve some time to thank you all. Reminding you in our social network, it's LBV Brazil, that we know you're accompanying us and we have to remind you that you can participate also registering in the second day of the event tomorrow. And we will all here be together. And now we're going to have Sueli Perioto. She's master's and doctor in, the, in education by the PUC University. And she's also a supervisor. Good evening. And God's presence, Jesus lives in our hearts forever. In our day arrived, it's wonderful. And it's also the Legion of Goodwill promoting this moment. And this is the happiness that we have in 2022 with so many people from various countries united to find solutions for a common challenge. And this is a matter of education that involves all of us well resolved and all very united. The union now, so we have the best perspective to change this difficult moment that is improving and will improve even more. Now we have the lecture of Sueli Perioto. She's doctor and master in education by the PUC University in the theme of challenges and learnings in the emotional health, reflexes of the pandemic, a view besides the intellectual. I would like to greet those that are with us virtually from 14 countries, the 24th Educational Congress of the Legion of Goodwill. And I greet all that are here with us. Our teachers, donors, parents, the whole network, the 83 units all over Brazil. And the greetings to all. We'll go to the president of the Legion of Goodwill, and on the 29th, he will be 66 years working, José de Paiva Neto. And so we are honoring him in such a special day with all your dedication and your abilities in this flag for education and economical spirituality, which is our proposal. And he created and it helps the children, and also for the economical citizen and our students. What he says is we need a view besides the intellectual area, and this is his view, a view besides intellect, this Congress that brings themes that are very connected to cognitive issues, intellectual issues, and approaches emotional health. We are, and he says this very much, integrated beings, and he reinforces that we cannot dissociate the brain from the heart. And this is a part of his book. Here is his book, and, the, and it's about education. And here on the page 150, and what he says is, human, machine, and the feeling of the heart. Education is also something important. It has to be diffused and faced by all of us as a path that is secure, that shortens the social distance between classes. It's antidotes against criminality, disorders, and everything that annulates the healthy citizens of a land. 
And so we have to think these concepts that fills our view and those that are connected to education. We have questionings that are very present. And we had also the lecture of Dr. Talita Pazeku, and still much to come. The, the resuming of presential classes has demanded a lot of dedication from the professionals in education. We have questions that are strong, that have been present, and we have to think about this and how to recuperate the time that the students were far from the school and how to, what do we do with what was not um, dealt with and how do we restore the learning? And the students lost many things. They were home. They were not, they lost the rhythm of going to school because they were home all the time. Here in the Legion of Goodwill, there's a, we are seeking to know and to speak how we have accepted this and how we have welcomed the students and the teachers and the parents and the students because everyone was far. And so we have to see the necessary needs of emotional issues. We also have received in the LGW a question about the, that zero evasion. How are we are going to maintain that the children continue in school? We also had a, we also wanted the children to always be in school, no evasion. But with the pandemic, there was a preoccupation and we didn't lose anyone in this pandemic period. All our students are with us still, but what were the strategies that we used to attain this result? And of course, I can say that we used a lot of strategies. We planned those classes, everything was aligned so we could maintain the students firm, farm away so they wouldn't give up studying especially when we think of the adolescents, because these adolescents already have more autonomy, and they could have stopped learning. They could have not come back to school at the beginning of, our, of the year in our schools. But besides these strategies that we believe that were prepared with so much love and so much precision in our planning, we also believe that it was in the pandemic that we were able to make loyal these students that didn't go away. We understand there was a connection that was established by the proposal that was different from the president of LGW by José de Paiva Neto, the, that we welcome the students in the, our school. It was something that guaranteed the connections before the pandemic. And so these, these, um, these were always stronger and with the school and the ties were strong. And this also helped us to their hearts were motivated to the study, continue to study when there was the resuming of the presential classes. Of course, we cannot romanticize and we cannot be, um, you know, thinking about this very simply because there are many challenges and, you know, there's a lot to deal with and there's challenges. And so we have to look at this and we have to resume the rhythm before the pandemic of two, two years ago. And so we cannot tell the student, let's go, let's do it. You were home and now we have to do everything and we had the content that was lost because the student is not the one, you know, he was a victim also. If he lost the rhythm, many factors were decisive. And so there were no conditions to leave the situation. And now we are here to help each one to get the rhythm back. We're bringing suggestions. We are telling them it's not that it will be quick. We know that it will be step by step. But now we cannot tell them, look, maybe it'll take a while. They don't have to know this. We have to animate them. We have to bring the families 
uh, with enthusiasm and reminding them that we have planning, we have conditions to add content because we say they were lost. But but we you know but there are things that we have we are attentive to this we are working with them individually in the L G W schools we observe like this this individual student we are looking at him and we are careful with each one and what will impact his emotional health we are really paying attention in our schools. For instance, we're going to bring in child education to reinforce, to prepare alphabetization. So this year we have, we intensified oral activities with music, stories, and, and this telling stories happens by the children. So what we preserve, there was an impact in the students in this age range. So when we speak about relation, the development of their oral issues, so the language was very harmed. Few of the students had um, l less oral stimulation because they were they integrated with very few students when they were home. So we have to have them be stimulated more. Other actions with the students with the with the mid school, 11, 12 years, is that we observe they are not present in school, nor in the fourth and fifth grade. So they were fourth, fifth grade. They were at home, and in this phase, what was consolidated many writing uh, abilities, also write, reading various texts. And many, they didn't have requirements, basic requirements like writing rightly, uh, correctly, the use of the capital letter in the beginning of the sentences, and other issues in grammar. And because they were also all very connected to technology, so there was a lot of abbreviations using also a lot of um, the internet. And so what we are doing now is that we are using some of visual stimulation. And so we're, we're stimulating with alphabets, with capital letters, and so they can consult this. And we are putting plates in the room. So like this, they attain the requirements for this year that they are in school again. In this age range, we have students that we are reinforcing them individually. Individually, Some teachers take these students individually and they have to be mapped out. So we have to see what are the difficulties and how they are. And like this, we get to know them and we tell them that things will get better and they will learn and we will resume everything and that things will happen. This is important to tell the student. Each teacher could look at the student and see very um, individual paths. We cannot massify. We cannot do this collectively. It is a collective planning, but the paths are individual. Of course, this is a lot of work. When we observe adolescent is more apathic and he, or we observe anxiety or not in, no interest so we have to align with the pedagogical coordinator so that everyone observe the student and we have to speak with the professionals in the schools so they will observe these students not only in the classroom and we also have to see and use also other professionals and so if we need them, they can help them, like the, uh, like um, other professionals. If they, Sometimes they will see, like social assistant, they will sometimes will have to go to the home to see if there are any problems with that student. So each case that calls our attention, we analyze it individually it is a lot of work yes it is but we have to do it we have to take care of our students and so while we are changing these things the applying of our contents the way we teach 
I have a, a Diane Evarista, who's a teacher, and she gave us a report, and she teaches science and biologies here in Sao Paulo. And she told us that, in general, she perceived that the students were tired of things that were very digital, which was incredible. And so she explored other resources. So she used the Blackboard. She did physical models of what she was explaining. She was bringing concrete things. For instance, the ninth grade, they, they together mounted a model to observe a wave. And so let me see the wave. They did a little video to see how, you see, they did this wave. They created this to show how a wave works. This is completely different when the students involve themselves in concrete exercises. She also had an atom in the class, and it was useful even for the 10th grade, and her colleague, Jujana Bos, who used this material in the, in the subject, which is chemistry. And you saw that it was done with cardboard, and the little balls were ping pong balls. Let me see the picture, please. You see? You can see it. And here are other pictures of the subjects that she dealt with to strengthen these activities. She also used the main parts of the plants, and they were generating and producing a sample of a pressed plant. And, this, and so what she showed, everything helped to create a herbarium. So when we see students working with this, it was really great. You see, we observe the interest. This is the herbarium. The, also, this electromagnetic spreading with the with the visual light that she, this teacher proposed. There was a reflection test of waves, uh, light waves. It was also successful. We see them looking in the dark, and so you see things of day to day that before they didn't even be interested in because it's. We like this, but it was great so that they could have the experience to learn and use their creativity and the teacher conducting this production. She also told us that the students of the ninth grade worked in an activity in science of, of sound materials. She did a partnership with the music teacher, Eduardo Stasio, and here are the students. They saw the sound waves in, in sand, in water, in the hand, in their body. It was also an important thing to do. In practical classes, they had to compose music, and they, and they produce sounds through waves with cups and bottles. And I think you know how this happens. Okay, these possibilities that are interdisciplinary with one teacher to the other, one subject to the other, helps engage and also amplifies learning to happen in this connection between the disciplines, between the subjects. They're not separated. Just uh, if we separate them, it's, you know, we can do the opposite. We could make things happen together. So science and music can come together. And so there was one evaluation because it was great because when they came back to school, there were lots of things to do. And we didn't want them to feel very massified because there were so many activities. But we have to make sure that everything is enjoyable and also they are learning and also peaceful. Diana also observed in general to do some classes outside also maintain the calm of the students. She also saw that they pay more attention. The, the sixth and ninth grade, they entered seven in the morning. So they started studying again. Can you imagine attaining the rhythm again, leaving home at 5.30, coming back to school? 
And so when they are outside and have a class outside, it's more stimulating and this helps them. But we'll say, ah, but they already, you know, quickly get in the rhythm. But the children have other moments, other timing, and this is important for us to respect. In this view, besides the intellectual view, which comes from José de Paiva Neto, we also see the abilities to welcome the children. I would like to highlight a situation of physical health that impacted also the emotional health. This happened in Belém, in the LGW, in Belém, the teacher Margarida Marchis, which is our school director in this unit, she reports the following. I'm going to bring you her story. She, she wrote, our student was put into the hospital in a, in a very difficult situation. Uh, uh, the, because the mother mother was very worried with the child. As teachers, we went and helped the parent. And there was a, someone in the school that did a solidary event. They wrote a letter to the student, and they wrote a great little letter with little drawings. The family was very emotional about this. The student is still in the hospital, but there still is the message of love from the students to this little child that's still in the hospital. And this was important positively for the students and also for the child that's in the hospital and his parents also. Each one doing their own way. These two took this letter to the family. This is the teacher. Sorry, these are the students. And this teacher, this picture was for the student. Here, look at what they did. And this is what the child received. We have a little video. The child's a little timid, but he's thanking the children so much. But the family wanted the child to be seen by his little friends in school. And so the child in the hospital also thinks, here, thank you for the letter. This is what the parents sent to the school. Each student has a special situation. Each school is facing their situation. Each student that's in front of me has something behind their story. We have another report that was told by our director from Brasilia, teacher Celia Mendes. She's going to narrate the situation of a child of three years that is now in the kindergarten. She says the following, the situation of the family is complex. In the moment of the pandemic, they came to Brasilia from Bahia. They were isolated because of coronavirus. The child was at home. They didn't have many contact with the other people. And he was welcomed by the school. And we analyzed. And the mother got a job because she had where to leave the child. And so the child went through an investigation because he was a little uh, he was a little late in his development. But slowly, with our multidisciplinary staff, we were able to help the child and the ch and also with nutrition. And also with all this, the child has improved. And also he was supported by food by the LGW, and so now he has also a bigger food uh, display. In pedagogical issues, the teachers of LGW in Brasilia, that the uh, 
advances are very important and his social interaction. Now he attends commands and also he communicates better and he also participates his abilities that offers support to the family, orienting the stimulus of autonomy at home. So as you see the happiness of the child, now they're at the zoo interacting here in physical education, doing the activities. Many times the student, the teacher helps the student and he is, he is developing very well. It's great to see these pictures because they show the interaction of the student and we know this brings a positive result. And to speak a little bit about the view, besides intellectual view, that we bring in the Congress so strongly, we cannot only think of the brain because the content is necessary. Planning exists. Yes, we have to recuperate content, but yes, emotional health, getting close, welcoming is what defines us as a schools that can value each human being. I'm going to present a definition of L, uh, LGW, which is Paiva Neto. He's always worried that we can give each individual attention. And he says how strong this is, a situation in the world of hunger. Empty stomachs not always are available to listen. So when we speak in this phrase, school has the intellectual, all the pedagogical issues. It has the welcoming so that the health, emotional health is established, but it also has to observe food of the students because they could many times arrive at school and they're hungry. And so that's why the student doesn't respond to the stimulation that we propose. So we have to respect the the students so that their bodies, which are vehicles of their way of learning, and we have to guarantee this. Extreme poverty, social economical situations, and the people of legion of goodwill have a differentiating situation of help. And Giusiani, Emigenio uh, of the LGW School of Paraná, she says, this is her report. I present a situation of one of our students that are with us since two years old. Now it's when kindergarten is five years. Single mother, three brothers, and so, one child has problems, so the mother cannot work. So that the mother is always looking for help for his autist child. So she received supplements to help her and her family because they were very vulnerable through moments and so they received also from LGW credit for cell, food, and also so the student could accompany the classes through the internet. And so she went to Paraná where she encountered the old place where she was living destroyed and LGW supported her she find another space in the school that helped her to find a new living area, and it really helped her. And so there was the area where she was able to raise her family, and it was very important. And the mother spoke about all the help. And here is some parts in the moment in the school of LGB school in Curitiba. So the children can have a Junina party and they were delivered the food. 
It was possible to co it was great to come back to school to the LGW school that strengthened the ties. Even when the student is not ours this year, they will now go to the kindergarten, first grade, and this child will always be our student. And what Josiane says, and I could even ask her, could can we continue teaching like we did before the pandemic? Do you think when students came to our schools, we could tell them, let's open the notebooks and let's see the content? When we look at the student and see the needs and anxieties, we will also observe our professional way of being. And who speaks is Daniele Toningoso. She spoke about how she deals with her students in this return. She changed some issues. She used to come into her classroom with all the materials that were organized and quickly used to enter the content. This was before the pandemic. She would interact with the students. But then she perceived that in this return, the presential return, the students needed interaction, a lot of it. So she adopted a different way. And so what she did before entering in the pedagogical content of the, she said that she arrives, she goes from student to student, asking them how you are, and so they are one-to-one, -one, and she perceives how they are emotionally, and she receives, and she gets a notion of what's happening to them. And so she analyzes a little bit of what the students are thinking, and so she does the content, and she also deals with the reality of the children at that moment. And so what she says is this helped very much to, for the kids to get closer to her and to listen to her because this age range, the students are adolescents and they need to have attention and they have to pay attention to us and they feel us being close to them. And so when they notice us, we can make more connections with the content. And she tells us that this first investigation about what is happening that day in their lives has been something very important. She also says that she's looking to the text that she proposes. So she says she's choosing texts that really connect to the reality of the kids, what they are going through, what we are facing, what is our life, you know, that they see themselves more in the activities that are being proposed. So it's something that she connects with the language and also it's something that is more pleasurable because she remembers that it has to make sense. It has to see that we what we are bringing them is important to them. Daniele also told us in the first months of the resuming presentially in the beginning of the year that LGW teachers, what was important, they gave bigger time to do the activity, so exercises and readings. We didn't use the same time uh, before the pandemic. With this, what did we perceive? That the students were getting rhythm in their own way, and so we saw that each student has their own time, but now, this is improving, but they felt very involved and very welcome. And also, as a Portuguese teacher, Daniele said that she needed to motivate them to read books because we will have the ex final high school exams. And so we would always ask them to read books. And so we have to stimulate and motivate them and this is very important. And, and in the sixth grade, what she did is that they did research words in the dictionary. They wrote it on a paper. They, they, they put these words in a bag. 
And then each one picked a word from the bag. And what they did is they categorized each word. And like this, they left the, uh, the activities that are always done on the desk. And they also were able to do new ways these same activities. So if this typical students that don't have any disorders or syndromes and also have not been simple, and we have a lot of challenges to resume the routine and calm down the expectations, the, what Diretora Casada says in, in Rio de Janeiro City of the Legion of Goodwill School in Rio. What the teachers have encountered and what they have been doing is individual to each child and also to each situation. I'm going to read what she said because there are details that we don't want to lose. She says, a student from LGW with Trisomia 21, she entered school as a baby and she had to be stimulated through the motor, motor simulation, cognitive, and they found and they were accompanied and was adapted and receiving stimulation for the development of the temporary developments to understand the pedagogical day-to-day -day issues, supporting, being supported by the teachers by LGW program for abilities. When this child arrived at the first grade, the child was super supported. But with the pandemic, the child had to go back to home. The family got support and orientation and to continue the development of these abilities with structured routines that would be done at home that was offered through video classes, giving continuity for alphabetization. Here you can see this video. The family was really working hard to make sure that everything was done. And so like this, the student developed this, and this was very important. Many goals were not achieved, but he had to receive special attention to develop abilities that are requirements for alphabetization and the understanding of structured day to day. In the return of the presential classes, the student before pandemic was also in pre two. He had to go to the third grade. The demands, his cognitive and social demands were potentialized with the maturation. So we did surveys and we saw that the student needed to develop a abilities, psychomotor abilities, so we could have measurable issues. And so this multidisciplinary staff in the school, we supported the student so we could collaborate with his development. There was a special moment for this child. And this is a program that is important. And this was individual. And this added a special attendance for this child. And this was so important to stimulate the child, presently understands school routine, maintains the activities, reads his first name when I put his name, and he copies the letters of his name, and he's able to write the letters of his work, his name. He identifies the vowels, A, E, and O. And a few days ago, the mother and grandmother came and saw his class, and they saw how he wrote his name. And the activity was important because they saw number and quantity. And the family was so happy to see the advances of the child when he came back to school. And they were so thankful for everything 
that the child had learned. What a great story. Wonderful. This student, Trisonomy 21, in the middle of a class, he wouldn't have this advance in a few months if there wouldn't, wouldn't be individual attention. And this is what we want you to know, for our emotional health to be better and so we can take care of these challenges that we always face we need to really individualize, as, Educa as Paiva Neto says, we need, besides the intellectual, we have to welcome. Today and tomorrow, you will have more uh, aspects of our school. And we will see what is happening in our schools and their experiences that are really interesting. And we continue together and in great continuity of our Congress. Yes, thank you, Silvi Perioto, and she's Master in Education of PUC São Paulo. And she was talking about challenges in emotional health and learning, thoughts of the pandemic and a vision that is besides the intellect. And this is education with spirituality, looking at each one and the totality. Now we would like to thank you that are with us today in this encounter. And I would like to welcome all of you in the chat of YouTube in your commentaries. Bettina Lopez is accompanying us, sending us uh, congrats for the important information that we are accompanying. Carolina Vaz that also is accompanying us in Argentina and says this is a challenge that we all face and our children we're very impacted, but now we have to find solutions for learning. This is what we are doing. Thank you for the audience in Argentina and the, in the United States speaking, the importance of seeing the LGW school offering opportunities for all the children. Wow, it's wonderful. Marcia from Rio de Janeiro about, uh, about Sueli Pazeto, Talita Pazeto and the strategies in classroom and also the importance of doing that the child understand the process of education, thinking about the processes. Sandra also congratulating for the lectures of today and says this knowledge of active mythologies helps a lot in work. She's also a social educator and is participating in our counter. Also, Carol Frois that is speaking about the importance of love and the view besides the intellect and how this transforms the view and to see each student individually and unique. A lot of commentary from our audiences. And you that are accompanying us, you can also enter our chat, your commentaries. But I have some special thanks. In Capão Bonito, we are accompanying 130 professionals from the network of education in Capão Bonito, and we greet all to Professor Silvana Silvana and all the professionals that are accompanying us in Capão Bonito. We also have 35 professionals in the network of Jardim School in Aracaju, Salvador, Bahia. Thanks so much to be with us. They were with us last year. We send them a great welcome. And Maria Venezia Gonzalva. We also want to, the registrations of Dr. Sitton Hall University in New Jersey, in the United States. They are also participating in this encounter that is being translated in Portuguese, Libras, Spanish, and English. And so we have participants in various countries 
that could be with us in our encounter. And now we would like to invite you, that you who are following us, we are in a period of pandemic. And since the beginning in this mobilization of of the Legion of Goodwill in March 2020, many things were amplified. Educational care to guarantee families and children all the support they needed. And we are still seeing the reflexes of this and the quantity of Brazilians that are hungry that it is really difficult, especially in food insecurity is a worry for our country. And the Legion of Goodwill is helping families and also our partners. We are counting on all of us to make sure that things improve. You who are accompanying us, please donate to the work of Legion of Goodwill. You could do it through QR code or entering our www donate, and there you can see the works that we are doing, emergency works, but others in the benefit of the families of areas in Brazil, but of other things that we do, because they have been also the continuous work of the institutions every day, the community centers, schools of the Legion of Goodwill, long-term homes of the Legion of Goodwill, helping citizens what they need and taking care of the heart and the brain. That's why we are asking for collaboration of the Legion of Goodwill and also enter our site and also our social media. And also I would like to thank especially the Conselso Alburquerque in the United States that gave a donation to the maintenance social educational of the Legion of Goodwill and also her mother and that was a voluntary of, L, of LGW for 50 years. And so, she, and so her, her daughter, we continue in the event, but we have one more moment of learning, a practical issue. We invite you to pedagogical action presented by Gisela Porcilia, pedagogical supervisor of the schools of the Legion of Goodwill. We're going to bring the following theme, the garden and its impact on the emotional health of the individuals. Hello, hi everyone. One more edition, the Ed Educational Congress. It's a pleasure to be here and to share with you one of the actions. It's a project that is being developed in the school of LGW in Curitiba, Paraná. This unit we attend kids from two to five years that spend the whole day with us. And also we have X, which is the project of X students that concluded the education with us. And now they are in the public school, but they spend the part of the day doing a few of our tasks. This project was elaborated in the space of MAPRE, which is a method of learning from research, emotional research and intuitive that was developed by the Legion of Goodwill. And we use this. Who is going to tell this about this and how it was developed and how it is being applied? Who are the people that are involved in this? This is Silvana Sileni, and she is part of our center educational center in Curitiba, Paraná. Let's get to know this. As responsible for this, I make an attendance and I ask questions in terms of how they're eating, what they're eating, if they like what food, and what is their nutritional um, tasks, and what they eat at home, and what the child likes and doesn't like. And many say that the children don't like fruit, vegetables, uh, 
salad. And so like this, I could direct my approach in terms of the nutrition when the child is in school. I accompany the child when they are eating, especially lunchtime. And then I can see what the child has in the plate and what is the food that he has on the plate, what he rejects, the salad, or the vegetable that the teacher is offering. And then I will know what child eats fruits and vegetables at home. And what they bring to us is the reflex of what they have at home. And with this visualization, I perceive that the children have more contact, rice and bees, right rice beans and meat many times they don't eat vegetables and salads that we offer with this contact we had the idea to make a garden the garden of goodwill so like this the parents and children were stimulated for this food at home so we started this project of the garden at the beginning of last year when the children were receiving uh, food and it was also uh, home teaching and and so for them to enter this program because they received we had to make sure that this garden was really well done it was began last year in the first semester when the students were receiving video classes and so Zilda which is our chef in the kitchen she planted all the vegetables and we chose this through the season and also the contact of the students and it was sent to the students and so like this they could learn how to plant at home and the care of the garden and some preparations so the children received and this made it possible so the Families were stimulated and the children also. This was divided in two fa few phases. First, we made the whole, we developed the whole program and everyone was involved. And in the second semester, some families chose to send the students to school. This project was a continuation. Some students that saw video classes and couldn't come back to school continued receiving these videos at home. But the students that started to participate in present, they had access to the garden. They were able to participate in planting each plant and they took care of this weekly and they visited it to see the development of these vegetables and also they collected it. Last year ended and this year came back to school. They're all here and this made it possible to re-inaugurate the structure. We had this big event to re-inaugurate the garden and each group had to plant one time a vegetable. So they came to the garden, they planted, and here we have it all taped, filmed, and they take care of this weekly. There are some classes that are specific, and they go to the garden, they take a look at the development and the growth and how it is, if there's sun or not sun, if there's shadow, and they also see the best moment to collect this. And we had two products. We had also the carrot. They were so enchanted with these, these vegetables when they took it and put it in their hand. This experience was really incredible for them. And I told them the nutritional function of that vegetable, how many calories, if we could do things with them, like if it was carrots, and if we could make salty carrots, and what recipes we could make with this carrot. And so this was very important for the kids. Then the children took this, they took this, so the children went to the kitchen, and they also took the scale, and they went to the kitchen, and they saw how to make kale, and they were able to eat it. 
and before they had to reject kale. But after they planted kale, now they eat kale. In terms of carrots, they took this product to the kitchen, gave it to Zilda, and she prepared with the carrot. And she put and she prepared this so they could eat this and they loved it. And this made it possible for the children had more curiosity to taste these vegetables. We are still doing this project and this involves all the children in the school since kindergarten and so on. And the male goal is to bring healthy food and healthy nutrition to the child and their family. It was important because in this period of pandemic, many children were all at home and only receiving informo information remotely. And so this was important for them to have contact with nature. They had contact with the earth, they planted and they saw the vegetable grow. And so it was important for them to see this process. So it's not only focused in the room, in the, the children were not also focused in the classroom. Like this, it was something that there was more contact with the nature, with earth. We made sure that the child could be contact with that nature. And so it was an experience of the whole cycle. So they had this in our school and it was important for them. Like this, they developed a sense of responsibility to take care of the plant. What a great product. And the children were all involved, the professionals, the family. And what does this highlight? The school couldn't make a horizontal garden, but with creativity, we had a we took a corridor and we built a vertical garden. And so with commitment and dedication, we can offer rich opportunities of learning to the children. The project continues and it also has a special guest, a biologist, Alexander Seleni, that came to the school and he went to teach the children the importance of making, uh, taking care of the earth and, and showing them how important it was to fertilize the gardens and why it is important. And like this, he showed them various stages and the benefit. And like this, the children were able to see the importance of having important nutritional habits. And this is also important for emotional health of the students. Now we have a guest that also told us what were the benefits of so emotional health. But in terms of the garden is also important for the emotional health of the children. Paula says, and the garden is a therapeutic area. It has benefits for mental issues, emotional, and even cognitive issues. And the benefits is the sense of responsibility because the child starts to learn what is to take care, take care of the other. And to take care of the other, it is a process that is necessary for your survival. And so with a garden, this happens, the same thing the child learns. Plant, take care of the earth, and then to put water. And it also, it depends on that child for the survival of that plant. Then the child learns in practice what it means, the real, the cycle of life, and also of more responsibility. Another benefit that is also very important is attention, because the child has its attention stimulated when observes the process of development of this little plant. It is growing that moment, so they start to pay attention, and the leaves pays attention in the different aspects between one plant and another plant, and they also start to stimulate the, the sensitivity, it starts to learn the different textures, 
the different colors? Will they be stimulated to the smells? And even also they will wake up to be able to try the taste and taste that uh, vegetable and that food that they never had tasted before because they resisted and now they taste because they are because the child took part in the whole process from planting and also picking it also the development of child with other people with this is socialization and this socialization is very important in the whole development process of the child especially in emotional health the child needs to relate with people that are in their environment and so in the moment when a child is planting because the child is not planting alone the child is accompanied by an adult is accompanied by its colleagues and by the family look what a great important moment for the father, the mother, for those, the teachers, also to be with this child, to be able to have benefits of this moment and to create each time connections, emotional affections. And this is important and it creates also in the child another awareness of collaboration, of working in a in a crew, working in a staff, in a team. This is what we need, and we need other people to do things that are important. The teamwork is important. Another benefit is that the child learns to contemplate what is beautiful, nature, because they are in contact with the nature. This helps to strengthen uh, self-esteem because the child sees the result of what they have done, the result of all the process of planting, and it, they admire this beauty. Nature is beautiful, and it is, and the child is part of the nature, and it also it has this sense of belonging that we all need to have, and the child starts to learn during the child's development. So when this contemplation of the beauty curse, self-esteem becomes better, connections are important with nature, and they establish this relation knowing the importance of the nature for their life and that the child is part of this nature and it is so alive and so present in our day to day. And so your emotional health is strengthened with all these benefits, we can perceive that the garden can also be, yes, an environment that is therapeutic and is so important for the emotional health, cognitive, because it activates memory, strengthens the learning of the child. The child becomes curious. When a child is curious, what's going to happen with that plan? They start to question, ask questions, and we know that when a child starts to ask questions, they are developing their thinking. And this is also important for the intelligence. So many benefits increase happiness, uh, make the stress less, diminish the sense of sadness, of tiredness, of even depression. All this makes that the garden be, is a big alley to the emotional health of the children. And uh, also important, develop patience because it's difficult presently, right? The child to have it, the fruit, the product or the vegetable of what they planted, they have to know how to wait the whole development of the process. And this will help the child to have the notion of that everything has its time and its moment. So we have to stimulate this ability that is so important to all of us, especially in these present days. That is so quick, everything has to be immediate and to develop in the child the know of waiting. Everything has its own time, its right moment, and even to 
collect. It's incredible how when a project well-stimulated plan brings so much benefit for the kids, benefits for intellectual and also human in terms of the relations, interactions, and will continue having in their adult life. This is the proposal, proposal of the Luigian of Goodwill, education with ecumenical education and a pedagogy of effect, of affection, economical person created by Pai Vanetu that has the commitment to train the brain and also the heart. This pedagogical line, which is positive, is applied in each of our units in the Legion of Goodwill. It could be in Belém, in Pará, in Brasilia, in Curitiba, as we already know of, in Rio de Janeiro, in Sao Paulo, and also in the educational units abroad, Argentina, Paraguay, Uruguay, and also soon we will have unit in the United States, all applying the same educational orientation that has the, the commitment to unite all economical citizens to contribute to an improved society. We hope that you liked our presentation. And this is the tip. Let's have a garden. You don't have backyard. Let's use a corridor, a small area, but let's have a little garden. Thank you so much for your attention. And we see you soon. Uh, this is the actions of the Legion of Goodwill. And the theme is the garden and its impact on the emotional health of the individuals. Many, during this period of the COVID, many started their gardens. So if this is so important, bring this to the children. This was a practice of the Legion of Goodwill. It's important for us to try this in school and at home. And so thank you very much, Gisela Portilla, and the teachers of the Legion of Goodwill in Paraná and Rio. And, and you who are accompanying us, you can receive a training of the professionals of the Legion of Goodwill. If you want your staff of educators be in contact with us, please see the information to do this. This is our phone, 32254618 and code 11. It is on your screen and you can see how to take away out your, your doubts and how you and your staff can get together with us. We are getting to the end of our transmissions of the first day of the 24th Congress of Education 2022. I want to thank especially the participation, participation of 14 uh, uh, areas, people in Argentina, Brazil, Arge Canada, Colombia, in the United States, Ireland, Mexico, Holland, Peru, Paraguay, Portugal, Uruguay, and Venezuela, 14 countries with United Congresses, and this we will continue tomorrow. And thank you all for being here tonight. And tomorrow we unite again to speak about this theme, the challenges of learning and emotional health, reflexes of the pandemic, a view bes uh, besides the intellectual. Tomorrow, Angela Matilda Suarez will be here with us, and she will talk about these themes. She will speak about the impacts of the emotion in cognition in learning and the relations, social relations and the fact in emotional relations. Also, the psychologist Karen Scavacini, Masters in Public Health 
in Sweden, a doctor in psychology, and a co-founder of the Institute Vita Levy. She's going to speak us about, is it possible to have mental health in challenging times? This is the question that she will help us answer tomorrow, the second and last day of our encounter in our event. The last invitation that we make with you is share with your families and friends about this encounter that is happening. You still can register, and it's just access www.lbv.congress and we end now and if you didn't post your pictures do it now and share your experiences and commentaries about this night thank you very much for being here with us the honor and now we are going to end this and saying 7 1930 7 30 p.m and also and now and also we conclude to the best vibes to you god's present jesus lives in our hearts forever See you tomorrow. Thank you.